I, th I think people are confused by her. The, the, the question of stubbornness is, 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 is irrelevant, in my opinion. Um, it, it's a fact that she was extremely, in, I mean, totally inexperienced when she first got into politics in 88 and made lots of mistakes as a result. Um, it's also true that she's not a, a natural politician. I mean, she's never, she was never involved in politics of any sort before 1988. But um, I think one can look back on the past 23 years um, of her life, the extraordinary life she's led, and see that she wouldn't be where she is today without some quite remarkable qualities. And the, the quality which I've identified is that when she, um, from quite an early age, she knew who she was and she, dis she knew what she wanted and she cultivated the willpower to achieve it. Um, she came to, um, to England to, Ox to study in Oxford in 1964 and there was a 10-year period between arriving in England and getting married. And in that period, having been under the thumb of her very fierce mother uh, throughout her childhood, she sort of blossomed in various ways. And she, she took all sorts of slightly odd decisions. She, she came to study politics, philosophy and economics at Oxford, didn't like it, tried twice to change subjects, once to English, and once to forestry. Uh, both times she was refused, and so she ended up getting a very poor degree. She got a third. Not a, not a, um, not a thing to be proud of, but she's never shown any sign of being ashamed of it either. I mean, she explains, I really only study when I'm actually interested, she says. She, um, when she was at university, she fell in love um, with a student there who was a Pakistani. And the relationship continued after she graduated, and it ended in tears. Um, and then she fell in love with the man who became her husband. And I sort of see her mum back in Rangoon. I can envisage her sort of receiving these letters from Sue and reading them with mounting anguish um, as she saw the strange decisions that Sue was taking. She. Um, a conventional and unimaginative, a dutiful daughter of that family would graduate with a good degree, then fly back to Burma and marry a suitable boy, or something like that. Instead, what did she do? And she, after graduating, after mucking about in London for a bit, she flew to New York to live with a, f a friend who was uh, an older lady who was a former pop singer in Rangoon before the war. And she stayed in New York for nearly three years and, and worked at the United Nations. So again, she was, she, was, she was very much doing what she wanted. And she decided, I want to do this. And she was sorry that her parents and her, uh, that her mother wasn't happy about it, but, but it was her life. And so I see this kind of, quite early on, she, she got her own compass, and that's what she's followed since. I don't think that uh, one wrote off the possibility that things would change again. It seemed, it seemed un, unlikely, but then there had, as I said, in 2002, there was an opening. Mm -hmm. In um, 2004, Kim Nunt started negotiations with her. Really, we needed to get Than Shui, the, uh, the strongman, out of the picture, and then, because he couldn't stand uh, her name or anything about and her. And do you think he's really out of the picture? Uh, well, I, I believe so, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I can't, um, we were discussing this before, and yeah. I, I find it just hard to believe that he can countenance what is happening now with these massive, I mean, he tried to assassinate her in 2003, very nearly succeeded. Right. Um, so, I mean, one didn't see it coming. I think everybody was, was stunned and amazed and delighted when things started to move in, in August and September last year. But one can't say it was a, you know, it was a shock, and it was a delightful surprise. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I think that um, the key thing that needs to happen is constitutional reform. The election of 2010, the election of this week, is on the basis of the 2008 constitution, mm -hmm. which gives the military 25% of, of seats in parliament without any election, and puts a, a, a military council with enormous unspecified powers above 
Parliament and able to declare martial law at any time. Sue herself has declared constitutional reform to be her first priority. And I think that, I mean, one can't see it's likely to happen because too many powerful people have a vested interest in that constitution. But who knows? I mean, crazy things have happened in the last nine months. Let's hope that she knows something we don't and that that is the next stage. Many um, people who would like to do business with Burma have been champing at the bit for many years. After all, it is one of the last remaining largely unexploited um, corners of Asia. People have been dying to get their, to get their uh, hands on it for, for a long time. And um, as we saw as from the passage which I read, the oil companies uh, had very little concern for the human rights situation when they started um, in sh onshore exp explorations in Burma. Um, I think one simply has to, to decide whether the human rights situation in a country is significant or not. And when you've got the sort of appalling human rights situation that you've seen in Burma ever since the autumn of 1988, and arguably long before that, then you know, does the West have uh, have a duty to to, to stand up and, and and try and change that behaviour or not? I mean, it's a it's a crucial kind of debating question. Um, the fact that we are now where we are, and that the mass of Burmese now can read what newspapers they want, vote for who they want in the elections, um, that they can. Uh, start trade unions, they can go in and out of the country um, and with a bit of luck in a year or two they will even have some jobs. Um, you know, this is all partially thanks to what the West has done, so no, I don't think it's a mistake.